How important is David? He's so important that the Messiah took his name. He's the son of David. He calls himself the son of David. He rules on the throne of David, as, as the Christmas angel said. In the city of David, there's born unto you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Hosea predicted one day Israel would turn back to God, come back to the land, and they would worship the Lord their God and David their king. So David is a metaphor for Jesus Christ. Jesus is both the seed of David and the root of David. Go to 1 Samuel 5, and I'd just like to take up. We, David is now king. We have gone through the painful wilderness experience. David has played the long game, as we spoke last week. He is king over all Israel. So let me read. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and your flesh. Previously, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and in. And the Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel, and you will be a ruler over Israel. Kings are shepherds. Kings are shepherds. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You will be ruler over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them before the Lord at Hebron. Then they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 40 years. Now, who else was anointed at the age of 30? Jesus Christ, yes, in the River Jordan. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years, 33, <laughs> over all Israel and Judah. Now the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites. Now, let me make an explanation. The, the name for the city Jerusalem at this time was Jebus. It had become a pagan city. It was originally a god, godly city uh, back in the days of Abram because that's where Melchizedek was the king. King Righteousness was the king of Salem. And Salem is Jerusalem. But by the time of David, it had been totally turned over to paganism and was one of the cities of Canaan that was doomed. And one of the first things that David does as, as king is focuses on Jebus or Jerusalem. Is the Lord had showed him there's something special about that city. Boy, I could wax forth on that. Jerusalem is the most important city in the world. There is no other city anywhere near it. If for no other reason that I can say Jerusalem is the most important city in the world, the city of Jerusalem is the only city on earth that God himself said in the Bible, I have put my name there forever. Whatever that means. Jerusalem is the city. At this time, it's a pagan city, and David zeroes right in. That's the first thing he's led to do as king of all Israel. He says... Uh, the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land. And they said to David, you shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will turn you away, thinking David can't enter here. So the old city of Jerusalem is a stronghold, a very impregnable fortress. So much so that the inhabitants of the land were overconfident, and they literally taunted David and his men and said... Not, if we were blind and lame, we could turn you away from this place. Nevertheless, David conquered the stronghold of Zion. That is the city of David. All three of the, okay, the, Jerusalem, the stronghold of Zion, the city of David, all the same city. All different names for the same city. Zion is one of the hills. It's the Temple Mount now, but it, there was no temple there then. Mount Zion is one of the hills of Jerusalem, okay? Uh, another one of the hills of Jerusalem is Mount Calvary, all right? Another one is Mount Moriah, where Abraham offered Isaac. The city of David. David said on that day, whoever would strike the Jebusites, let him reach the lame and the blind who are hated by David's soul through the water tunnel. Therefore, they say, the blind or the lame shall not come into the house. So they're, they're taking up that taunt. They're answering back. David says, I hate them that say they're the blind and the lame. Now, he's not saying he hates the disabled. It won't be a few, but a few chapters, and he'll take a disabled man into his house and treat him like a prince. He's saying, if they claim that they're the blind and lame, I hate them. They're my enemies, and they won't keep me out. 
So David lived in the stronghold and called it the city of David. And David built all around from the millo and inward. And David became greater and greater for the Lord of hosts was with him. So he won a, a big, a, won a very important battle in that he took the city of Jerusalem and he made it his city, the city of David. There's something about that city that he knew, and I'm sure he knew it by the Spirit of God. That it, that it was a special place and that that was his first task as king is to take that city and make it his headquarters. Now, um, I want you to hold your finger in 2 Samuel and turn with me to Psalm 47. So what, what we want to do sometimes in these stories is show you the corresponding psalms that go along with this. Psalm 47. What did David, uh, how did he praise God when... He took Jerusalem. Okay, Psalm 47 says, Clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of joy. For the Lord Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdues the peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chooses our inheritance for us, the glory of Jacob, whom he loves. Selah, that means stop and think. God has ascended with a shout, the Lord with the sound of the trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises, for God is King of all the earth. Sing praises with a skillful psalm. God rules over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people have assembled themselves and the people at the, as the people of the God of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. And then the next one goes with it. Listen to this. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. In the city of our God is the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion in the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God in her palaces has made himself known as a stronghold. For lo, the kings assembled themselves. They passed by together. They saw it when they were amazed. They were terrified. They fled in alarm. Panic seized them there. Anguish as of a woman in childbirth. With the east wind you break the ships of Tarshish. As we have seen, heard, so have we seen. In the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will establish her forever. We have thought on your loving kindness. Kindness, O God, in the midst of your temple. As in your name, O God, so is your praise. To the ends of the earth, your right hand is full of righteousness. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion. Go around her. Count her towers. Consider her ramparts. Go through her palaces that you may tell it to the next generation. For such is God, our God, forever and ever. He will guide us until death. I want to show you something in this. He's praising God for the conquest of Jerusalem. But he also sees a vision of the end of the world. What is the recurring theme of the end of the world? The kings of the earth gather themselves together and create a siege around Jerusalem. And Jerusalem becomes such a problem for the whole world that that's really the issue that plunges the world into the final apocalypse. He said, see, in verse 4, the, the kings assembled themselves. They passed by together. They saw it. They were amazed. They were terrified. They fled in alarm. Go back to 1 Samuel 5. I think of Zechariah. In the last days, I'll make Jerusalem a cup of trembling to all the nations round about. In the last days, I'll make Jerusalem a stone of stumbling to all the earth. All who trouble themselves with it will be lacerated. Joel 3, I will bring all nations to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's right outside of Jerusalem. And I will bring them into judgment there. I will slap a suit on them says the Lord, the judge of the earth. <laughs> See, this is, this is Jerusalem. And so this is one of the significances of this chapter. He takes Jerusalem and makes it his own place. This is the place where Jesus was crucified. 
That means this is the place where Satan was dealt a fatal blow. This is the place that the Bible says when Jesus comes back, his feet will touch on the Mount of Olives. This is the very place where Abraham offered Isaac. This is the place, oh, this is the place that the UN says cannot be part of Israel. <laughs> That's another subject for another time. Jerusalem is just so significant. Okay. So uh, when David is, uh, takes Jerusalem, the second thing is he builds his house. He builds his house. And this is a perfect, legitimate thing to do. It's a Sabbath theme. He does his work fighting the Jebusites, and then he builds his house. And it says, verse 11, Then Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messages to David with cedar trees and carpenters and stone maces, and they build a house for David. Now this is too is a prophecy, because Hiram is a pagan king. He's in Tyre, which is in southern Lebanon. He's not Jewish. But what you have here in a vision is Jew and Gentile working together to build a house for the Messiah. Okay, this is, uh, this is a prophetic thing. And Hiram will have a role even in the temple. And David realized that the Lord had established him as king over Israel. And that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. Meanwhile, David, oh, oh this is ominous, took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he came from Hebron. And more sons and daughters were born to David. As I say, this is always a negative thing in the Bible. Polygamy is never, ever considered positive. This was what part of David's downfall. Now these were the, the names of those who were born to him in Jerusalem. Shamua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ebhar, Eleshua, Nepheg, Japhia, Elishama, Eliada, and Elephalet. Now, so you got this, you got the war in Jebus, and then you got the Sabbath. He builds a house with the Gentile king. And now we go back to war again. When the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to seek out David. And when David heard of it, he went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines came and spread themselves out in the valley of Rephaim. Now Rephaim means giants. There were giants. <laughs> Like Goliath, okay. In the valley of Rephaim, then David inquired of the Lord. And once again, it's a pun on Saul. David Shaul. David asked of God. Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. So David came to Baal Perizim, which means the master of the breakthrough. And defeated them there and said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like the breakthrough of waters. Therefore he named the place Baal Perizim. They abandoned their idols there. So David and his men carried them away. Now that too is a pun, by the way, 21. They abandoned their idols because the word for abandon is azab and idols is atzab. They abandoned their idols. Remember what happened in a previous battle in 1 Samuel, the children of Israel used the ark of the Lord like an idol, and they lost it. They, they lost it, and that was a turning point for Israel. That's when Israel died. The ark was captured. In this case, it's a reversal. Now the pagans abandoned their idols, and of course their idols abandoned them, because that's what idols do. You can't count on them. And the children of Israel carried them away. Now the Philistines came up once again and spread themselves out in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord. He said, you shall not go directly up. The Lord did. He's got, he's got access to God. He's got the high priest with the, with the Urim and Thummim, with the ephod, the method of divination. The Lord says, no, don't go attack him directly. Circle around behind him. He says... You shall not go directly up, circle around behind them, and come at them in front of the balsam trees. It shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees. Then you shall act promptly, for then the Lord will have gone out before you to strike the army of the Philistines. Now what's verse 24 tell us? That every single battle has got a spiritual component and a natural component. And the natural component is only a reflection of the spiritual component. He says, don't attack until you hear the rustling in the treetops. 
the Lord allowed him to hear. Because the Lord's name, one of the Lord's names is the Lord of hosts, which means the Lord of the armies of angels. Don't even attack till you hear the wrestling. Once you hear that, then go. Then David did so just as the Lord had commanded him, and he struck down the Philistines from Geba as far as Gezar. Now remember that everything we've been reading about is in the context of the Philistine crisis. And the whole civil war between the house of David and the house of Saul put fighting the Philistines on, on hold. And the whole time of Saul chasing David basically put fighting the Philistines on hold. So the Philistines were deeply, deeply, deeply entrenched. But now that there's a Messiah, an anointed king, and he's got a stronghold, Jerusalem, and the nation is united. For the first time in 40 years, the Philistines are being put to the wood, as they say. Absolutely, utterly routed, destroyed, pushed out. This is the thing. I mean, it would be David that would finally wipe out the Philistines. Now David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David rose and went with all the people who were with him to Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the, the very name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned above the cherubim. Okay, now it's a double theme, okay? In the first part, you got him fighting the Jebusites, and then rest. Okay, they get rest. They get the city of Jerusalem. They get a stronghold. Okay, it's work and then rest. And now you had them fighting Philistines. And now another rest in the form of the recovery of the Ark of God. You see, when David, oh, the rest in the first part was David's home and David's throne, David being ensconced, enthroned. The rest in this second part is God being enthroned again in Israel. See, this is the thing. You cannot understand Samuel unless you remember. When the ark of God was taken prisoner, and then when it returned, that wasn't the end of the story. The Jews mishandled the ark of the God, and then they were afraid because a plague broke out when they mishandled the Ark of God. So it was kept at somebody's house for 20 years. <laughs> and the Ark is central to the worship of Israel. Israel is not alive if worship is not its center. We are not alive if worship is not our center. The Ark of God is on the sideline. This is something that bugged David all his life. And notice his priorities. As soon as he becomes king, he does two things. He takes the city of Jerusalem and he immediately goes to retrieve that Ark. He wants that Ark back in the central place in the nation. So he gets mighty men and he goes to fetch the Ark at Baal Judah. And notice what it says about the ark. The ark, it personalizes it. The ark which is called by the name, the very name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned above the cherubim. Now this is in strict con uh, contrast to the earlier way that they treated the ark. Hophni and Phineas says, let's go get it. We'll use it. We'll fight the Philistines with it. Philistines go, we have, they have it. We're in trouble. It? It's who? The ark of God is the very throne of God. And according to this verse, it's not empty. God himself is sitting on that throne. The name, he says, the very name of the Lord of hosts. Who, not it, who is enthroned above the cherubim? See, in the earlier chapter, David gets to be enthroned. And Jerusalem gets to be his stronghold. But the next I order a priority, the enthronement of God himself in Jerusalem. Now they placed the ark of God on a new cart that they might bring it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Now where did they get the idea to put it on the cart? Does anyone know? That's what the Philistines did. The Philistines put it on a, a, a cart and sent it back to Israel. So they just put it on a cart. Okay. They didn't do their homework. 
He didn't research the Bible, as you'll see. Because the Bible says, no one is even so much, to, except the high priest, is even so much as to be able to see it, let alone touch it. But they pick it up and put it on the cart. Because they think they're doing a good thing. They're going to bring the ark to Jerusalem. That is a good thing. But uh, not this way. They place the ark of God on a new cart that they might bring it from the house of Abinadab, which is on the hill, and Uzzah and Ahio. Uzzah means strength. The sons of Abinadab were leading the new cart. So they brought it with the ark of God from the house of Abinadab, which is on the hill. And Ahio was walking ahead of the ark. Meanwhile, David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments made of fir wood, with lyres, harps, tambourines, castanets, and cymbals. Ever since uh, Samuel and his revival, music began to be very, very much associated with the worship of God. Now David is going to take this way further. Because what he'll eventually do is organize all the Levites into musical groups and give them assignments to do nothing but get before the ark and sing and praise God 24-7. Okay. It's a, he revolutionized the worship of Israel. He, he's a, he's, God used him in so many ways. But at this point, so they're all celebrating, and they're moving the ark on this cart. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out toward the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. Oh, the ark, the ark slipped! I better stop it! As soon as he touched it, he died. He died right there. What was his mistake? He was trying to do a good thing. Don't want to let the ark fall in the mud. He was struck dead by God. As soon as he reached out to touch it. That's what it says. It says, The anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah. And God struck him down there for his irreverence. And he died there by the ark of God. Well, think about this for a minute. We just sang it tonight. Yahweh is holy. Okay, what, who's Uzzah think he is? Is he going to save Yahweh from falling in the dirt? Or is his hand purer than the dirt itself? What presumption? Had they took a look at the Torah of God, especially the book of Numbers, they would have realized that it's a miracle they all weren't slain. Because no one's supposed to touch the Ark of God except the high priest. And any priest that do move the Ark of God is not supposed to be on an ox cart. It's supposed to be on holy poles, on holy shoulders, a certain distance from the Ark itself. And no one can save the Ark from falling in the dirt. And neither does God need anyone to save him. And no hand is cleaner than the very dirt that the Ark might fall in if God's pleased to fall into the dirt. Who does he think he is? Well, he got killed. You know, earlier it says, God, God broke out. God of the breakthrough. He broke out against the Philistines, right? Well, here he breaks out against Uzzah. For his lack of the fear of God, his irreverence. The Lord broke out. The anger of the Lord burned against him. And because he took hold of the ark thinking he'd stop it. Now David became angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah. And that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. They've named the place Break Out Against Uzzah to this day. David became angry. He's it ruined a wonderful occasion here. We're, we're doing the right thing. But it wasn't the right thing, and it wasn't in the right way. But not only was he angry, this is the positive thing, verse 9. So David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? I mean, ever since he was a boy, David longed for the ark to be restored to its place in the nation. Did you know that? 
He, he talks about that in one of the Psalms, Psalm 132. We heard of it back when I was in Bethlehem about the fate of the ark. When will the ark be brought back? When will the worship be central in Israel? When will God be the center again? I mean, how many have that same holy affection for our day right now? Oh, God, let people revolve around you again. But, but he tried to do it without... <laughs> He didn't have enough of the fear of God to research the Torah. He should have gotten the priest to read Numbers because it says explicitly how to conduct the ark. Well, someone says, well, the Philistines got away with it. Well, the Philistines weren't the custodians of the ark, now were they? Actually, if you read the account closely, the Philistines were ignorant, but they had more reverence for the ark than, Jew than David did. Catch it, he was like, catch it, it's going to fall. Really? You're going to stop God from falling? Who do you think you are? <laughs> the Uzzah died. David's afraid. Verse 10, David was unwilling to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David with him. That's where the ark belonged. That's where the will of God was. God said that Jerusalem is the place where I put my name. That means that the ark belonged in Jerusalem because he called the ark the name, the very name of the Lord. So David's instincts were right. This ark has got to come to Jerusalem. Now, what are we waiting for? We're waiting for Jesus himself to come where? To Jerusalem. See, all these stories are foretastes. They're prophecies. How could we do this? David was unwilling to move the ark of the Lord and the city of David with him. But David took it outside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. So now the ark gets to go to the house of a Gittite. Now, a Gittite, it, get, get, a Gittite is someone from Gath. In other words, there's total Gentiles. It's the same city that Goliath came from. The ark gets to go to a guy named Obed-Edom, which his name means the servant of man, okay? And he stays at Obed-Edom's house. Now, that too is a prophecy, okay? Because in the days of Jesus Christ, the Jews reached out and touched the Messiah and handed him over to the Gentiles. And they have been without God for 2,000 years. Well, where did God go? To the Gentiles. He came to America. He came to England. He came to France. He came everywhere in the world. Nigeria. Wherever the gospel goes, that's where God goes. The God has gone to the Gentiles, just like the ark had to go to the house of a Gentile, Obed-Edom, uh, one of the people from Gath. It says, Thus the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. How would you like to be... I love that, to have the ark at my house, to have Jesus at my house. It all, you know, it's almost enough to make David jealous that they're being blessed with the ark. What's Paul say? That when Jesus Christ goes to the Gentiles, that's to make the Jews jealous. He's blessed. Oh, but Edom's blessed. Now it was told King David, saying, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Eden and all that belong to him on account of the ark of God. Yes, amen. The Lord has blessed the Gentiles on account of the person whom the ark actually points to, which is Jesus. And so David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Eden into the city of David with gladness. Okay, obviously he did his research. Obviously he went to the book of Numbers. Obviously he went to the book of Deuteronomy. And obviously he got it right this time because he was able to do it. Okay, he, was a, he, he didn't put on, uh, and so it was, he didn't put on a cart. He put it on the shoulders of Levites. Verse 13, and so it was that when the bearers of the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. So wherever this house was, between it and Mount Zion in Jerusalem, every six paces, they would stop right there, make an altar, and make an offering to the ark. That is a lot of offerings, okay? Every six paces, whatever that is, okay? And so it says, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. In other words, he took off his royal robe, and he strips himself down to the basic clothing of a, work, a working man out in the hot sun, 
And I mean, he's doing this whirling dance. That's what the word dancing means. He's whirling and he's accompanying the ark and he's praising God so much that his wife, Michal, the daughter of Saul, hates him for it. Because he's getting too much into his religion. He's making a fool of himself. And so she actually hated that. So David and all the house of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. So we're back to praise. We're back to worship. Then it happened as the ark of the Lord came to the city of David that Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. She hated him. So they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent which David had pitched for. See, here's the thing, okay? You had the end of an era when the ark was captured, and here's why. Because up until that time, in a place called Shiloh, the very tent that Moses was instructed to, to construct, which was very elaborate, was destroyed and never seen again. It's the end of an era, okay? So where did the ark live? Well, the ark lived with Gentiles. And then when David came, what did he do? Well, he didn't have a temple. He didn't have a tabernacle. He did not have the tent of Moses. But David did something very extraordinary. He set up his own tent, the tent of David. And he instituted a very new worship. Okay, now he's waiting because the ultimate goal is the temple. But what do you do in the meantime? He's not going to live without worship. So he set up something called the Tabernacle of David. All that was in it was the ark. He set up the tent. And they placed it in the tent which David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. When David had finished offering the burnt offering and the peace offering... He blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Further, he distributed to all the people, to all the multitude of Israel, both the men and women, a cake of bread, one of dates, one of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed each to his house. He gave refreshment and food to all the people. But when David returned to bless his household, Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to hear, meet David and said, How the king of Israel distinguished himself today. He uncovered himself today in the eyes of his servants, maids, as one of the foolish ones, shame shamelessly uncovers himself. You made a fool of yourself, David. You degraded yourself in front of the maidens of Israel. She's rebuking him. Rebuking him for what? For praising God. And for getting, just, go, just letting loose. And he says something back very sharp to her. 22, I will be more lightly esteemed than this. You know what he's saying? You think that was embarrassing? I'll even take it further. I'll go beyond that. For God, if it's for God. What do you think I'm putting on a show? If it's for God, I'll even go further. This is the right spirit. To never be ashamed of God and never be ashamed to worship. And don't let anyone ever shame you Amen. for praising God. I'll go further than this. I'll be humble in my own eyes, but with the maids of whom you've spoken with them, I'll be distinguished. In other words, I'll go for, so far that I'll be distinguished for it. And guess what happened to Michal? Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death, which is a disaster to a woman in the ancient world. An absolute disaster. Let me read some of the Psalms that go along with his procession, the temple. One of them is Psalm 24. Would you turn there? We'll just read a couple of psalms before we close. This is a beautiful, beautiful highlight in the Bible. But notice that there was two attempts to bring the ark to Jerusalem. The first attempt ended in death because of the lack of the fear of God. Even David didn't check out the scriptures. Just did what he thought was right. Well, there's a way that seems right to a man that it ends with death. And then the procession ends for a while. 
And the ark goes with the Gentiles. But then at the end, they repent. They repent, and they properly receive the ark. And it comes to Jerusalem. And guess what? That is the story of human history. That the Jews... What I think of when I read this is the procession of Jesus into Jerusalem. Everything happened the same way. They praised him. Hallelujah to the son of David. Notice they kept using David. Son of David, son of David. Hallelujah to the son of David. They're waving palms and everything. But what do the religious leaders do? Like Michal, they go, make him shut up. Don't let him praise you. And even the children were praising him. And he said, look, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, God has ordained strength. Stop the enemy. But because of that unbelief, then that procession ended with death. The ark did not make it to Jerusalem. Therefore, Israel was not saved, and they were not exalted, and they were not placed where they're supposed to be. Because the meaning of Israel is that the people of God with God in them. What good is a holy people without God? Where did, the, where did Jesus go? He went to the Gentiles. But what happens in the last days? Israel realizes their mistake. They get jealous. They see the blessing. And they get it right. The Bible says that he's coming back. Where? Jerusalem. They will look on me whom they have pierced and mourn for me as for his only son. It's the enthronement of God on Mount Zion. That's why what makes uh, 2 Samuel 6 so amazing. God will be enthroned on the holy mountain. God will come back to the holy people, and they will get it right in the end. Uh, Psalm 24 is one of them. Uh, on entering Zion, the king of glory entering Zion. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully, he'll receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who see Seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads. O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? Why, he's the Lord of hosts. He's the King of glory. See, this is the procession. This is what David composed for the procession. Who can enter the holy hill? Who can rise up the holy hill? Actually, what it says is, who will go for us? Who? Who will go for us? Who has the clean hands? Who has the pure heart? Who is holy enough to go for us up before the holy God? We know who it is. Jesus, the great high priest. Amen. Amen. Who will go? And who doesn't, hasn't sworn deceitfully? Who hasn't lifted up his soul to falsehood? We have such a high priest. Amen. And then it gets outside the gates of Jerusalem. And the procession stops. And they, and they say, lift up your gates, O ye, o ye gates. Lift up your hands. Be lifted up, you everlasting doors. Why? So the king of glory may come in. They open the gates and in comes the procession. And they say, who is this king of glory? Why, he's the Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. That is one of the Psalms. Another one is Psalm 96. I think it's interesting to see the Psalms that went with, with the events. Psalm 96. It was the same occasion. Sing to the Lord a new song. Can't you imagine him stopping every six feet, offering an offering, praising the Lord, whirling in his dance, 
Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless His name. Proclaim good tidings of His salvation from day to day. Tell of His glory among the nations, His wonderful deeds among all the people. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He's to be feared above all gods. For the gods of the people are just idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. See, Israel had not had a sanctuary. They did not have a functioning priesthood. They did not have the Ark of the Covenant. The center of that nation had been gutted, and the Philistines had a field day, and King Saul had let them down. But now, for the first time in decades, this man of God restored the glory back, brought the Ark back to its rightful place. He, 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 builds, he builds a house for himself, a house for the Messiah with the help of the Gentiles. He takes a city, the most important city on earth, Jerusalem. And then the most important and central thing, the highest priority of all, God himself. He goes and fetches God. And God, he doesn't, doesn't do it right. So God is true, true to himself. He didn't do it right at first. And God will never deny himself. So Uzzah died. The strength of man shall die. But when they go back and humble themselves, and when they think about their ways, and when they go back to the book, then, what joy, right? Verse 7, ascribe to the Lord, O families of the people. Ascribe ye to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering. Come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. He will judge the people with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all it contains. Let the field exult and all that is in it. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy. By the way, you know what the trees of the forest are? The nations of this world. One day, one day they will see. Like it says in the book of Revelation, one day all nations will bow down and worship God because they will finally see the truth behind the fake news, the righteousness of his holy acts. Amen. He says, verse 13, before the Lord, for he's coming. He's coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. This is what he, this is what he uh, composed for the occasion of the, of the movement of the ark, of the reversal, of the defeat back at Aphek, of the restoration of the glory to Israel, of the enthronement of Israel's God in the center of the nation and the city appointed by God where his name is. Now, before I close, you consider that city today and you consider the rumblings of the nations around it. And you consider, like we read in Psalm 48, the nations of the earth looked, they gathered, they took a look. They're terrified. And their consternation. I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling to all the nations round about. And I'll make Jerusalem a heavy stone that all the people of the earth are going to stumble over. <laughs> it all started right back here. King David. I think it was like three or four years ago. It's the 3,000th anniversary of King David taking Jerusalem. Did you know they celebrated it? Well, the Jews did, not the rest of the world. <laughs> the rest of the world doesn't celebrate. The rest of the world wants to change its name to Al-Quds. You know, that's an Arab name for Jerusalem. To Al-Quds or Al-Aqsa. From the Quran, it says, Muhammad got on a winged horse and went to Al-Aqsa and ascended to heaven and prayed with Jesus and Moses. Al-Aqsa, they say, is the farthest place. They say, that's Jerusalem. And so, in this little story we read about in King David's priorities, we also see shades of the end of the earth, the end of the world, the judgment that's coming, the kings of the earth. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this special book. 
It's amazing to us, Lord. It'll be, uh, the kings of the earth will be amazed themselves when they finally see what's going on. But Lord, you shared with us this little flock. We nothings out here in Iowa in the middle of nowhere. You shared your secrets with us and with all who fear thy name. So bless, O oh Lord, the reading of the word and the exposition of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everybody.